Hey everyone, this is Anthony Locke with Tory Hills Capital, and I want to welcome you to the Millennial Precious Metals webcast for January 13th, 2022. Hope everyone's doing well under the circumstances, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for taking the time uh, today to join our virtual lunch. We're very excited to bring you Millennial Precious Metals today. Uh, they are a Nevada-based exploration company with seven properties in Nevada and a newly acquired property in Arizona. The company is starting an, an aggressive drill program at its key assets. Uh, with the PEA expected later this year. Uh, Millennial Precious Metals trades on the OTC market under the ticker MLPMF and on the TSX Venture under the ticker MPM. It's currently trading at 53 cents per share US, representing a market cap of only $73 million. So, you know, based on the fact that the company has a very strong balance sheet, a high percentage of institutional ownership, and is trading at a discount to its peers, uh, we feel there's plenty of upside. Uh, as the company continues to execute its strategy. And uh, based on the current outlook for higher inflation in the US, uh, we feel gold prices uh, will move higher, making precious metal stocks uh, very attractive at this point. So we feel that Millennial is well positioned to benefit from the positive outlook for the space. Uh, with us today to discuss Millennial precious metals operations and growth strategy going forward is the company's president and CEO, Jason Kosek, and the company's vice president of corporate development, Jason Banducci. Welcome. Great to have you both on today. Thank you very much for having us, Anthony, and thanks to uh, all your listeners out there for taking the time to joining us today. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, before we get started, I just want to mention uh, everybody knows the format, um, but if our viewers have any questions during the presentation, just simply type your question into the Q&A or chat box, and we'll make sure it gets answered. So with that said, I'm not going to turn it over to Jason Kosek. Jason, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, like I said, thanks for joining everyone. I'll do uh, a quick background on how the company was started, uh, go into the team share structure. I'll go into the uh, individual assets on a high level. Uh, I'm a geologist by trade, so I'll, I'll keep everyone out of the weeds for simplicity's sake. But uh, if anyone has any technical questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat and we can do uh, a, a, a deeper dive into that. Um, I myself, I come from the Talisker Group. We did all the technical due diligence for Osisco, the Osisco group of companies. Uh, Osisco uh, found and built uh, Canada's largest gold mine and started a royalty company. So between myself and Terry, we've looked at, and Ruben, we've looked at thousands of projects. Uh, the base of this was we were trying to get a toehold into the United States uh, and primarily looking at assets in Idaho, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, and Arizona. Uh, to build this portfolio, we did over 337 desktop reviews. So look at 337 individual projects from a desktop perspective. From that, we whittled it down to 47, and we looked at 47 individual projects, um, boots on the ground um, type of stuff, and really, from that evaluation, built the platform for what we're gonna to discuss today. So this isn't like a, a typical company where the name changes, new management changes, and it's the same asset just with uh, some new uh, makeup on it. This is a brand new story that hit the market in, in May of 2021. Uh, we will be making some forward looking statements. So I advise anyone out there to look at the detailed disclaimer on the company's website. What we are doing here as Millennial is building a multi-million ounce, multi-asset production company. And one of the key things that we're focusing on is near surface heap, le heap leachable ounces in the top mining jurisdiction. I know everyone says tier one jurisdiction. Well, the reality is, is Nevada is number one um, uh, place to, to, to operate in the world. Um, there's, there's plenty of rankings from the Fraser Institute uh, downwards. Uh, why we're focusing on near surface heap leachable ounces is one, the cost to drill them off. So the cost per discoverable ounce is extremely low, um, which equates to less shareholder dilution. The cost to put them into production is also extremely low to minimize against dilution and debt when you're putting them into production. Um, and what we were looking at too is from, from an asset level selection criteria <clears throat> is each asset needed to have clear visibility of a million ounces of oxide, have good leach kinetics 
on the oxide have a low strip uh, and good leach kinetics on the sulfides. And our two development assets that we're going to talk mostly on check all of those boxes. Um, right now, you know, if you just take a snapshot at the, at the company, we have a very well diversified portfolio of assets to minimize uh, risk in, in, in a risky business, to be quite honest. So we have Mountain View and Wildcat. Think about them as a combined uh, project. It's a hub and spoke model. They host the 1.2 million ounces of oxide, 700,000 of potential. Most of the drilling will be going ongoing at Mountain View and Wildcat. Um, we are drilling at Mountain View right now. A minor amount of the drilling goes to Red Canyon, which is a very exciting exploration story. It sits right on the heart of the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, 35 kilometers south of the Cortez complex, in the same rocks as Cortez, Pipeline, Gold Rush, Horse Canyon, uh, to put that into perspective for your listeners, it's the biggest complex that is run by Nevada Gold Mines, which is uh, the Barrick uh, Newmont JV. Uh, across those three projects, as I mentioned, that'll take up most of the drilling of the 20,000 20, meters. We also have a nice exploration portfolio, Dune, Eden, Mar, Oslo. They're phase one target generation work, so they need a lot of systematic scientific exploration that, frankly, the market doesn't care about. Uh, but it allows the company to have a nice growth portfolio. Uh, current cash balance uh, is just under $16 million. I think, and you'll see this on, on the upcoming slides, is that between myself, Terry, and Ruben, we've put up over 59 million ounces of discoveries. Um, I think the key metric to those ounces is the quality of those ounces. And that 59 million ounces is across seven projects. Five of them are in construction or in production today, and that speaks to the quality and the track record of the team. Um, I myself, I'm a structural geologist by, by, by trade. I uh, did an MST MBA at Queens, uh, put the first holes into Cote Lake, which is now Canada's third largest um, gold mine. Uh, subsequent to that, I was with I Am Gold for a number of years. Uh, and then joined the Talisker group where we did all the technical due diligence, as I mentioned, for all of Cisco related companies. So the Windfall Project, um, uh, Barkerville, which is now Caribou, uh, Minera Alamos, and, and onwards. Terry and Ruben are the two other founders. Uh, They're both PhD brilliant geologists who have the Los Colossus and Grand Malate discoveries, which combined is around 40 million ounces. Uh, Mike Leskovic runs a fund uh, in Toronto, Northfield Capital. Sarah Heston is a business professor at Stanford. And Eric Tremblay is a professional engineer who built Canadian Malartic, which is Canada's largest coal mine. Uh, Jason Banducci is also on the line. Uh, I'll let Jason uh, introduce himself. Um, but he really rounds up the team with a um, uh, really strong skill set from the investment banking side and capital markets. Thanks, Jay. So, so as Jason mentioned, uh, my background is primarily on the finance and capital markets side. I spent the last eight years on the on the banking uh, in the banking world. The last five of which were mining investment banking at GMP Securities uh, and Stiefel. Um, I was the lead banker on the go public transaction uh, when Millennial raised twenty four million dollars last year uh, on an oversubscribed financing. So I became, uh, you know very close with the company, the assets and the management team. Uh, and for me, you know, I've, I've sat on the other side of the table for many years and been pitched by hundreds of mining companies. Uh, this was one that caught my attention. So making a career change and, and jumping over uh, to this side of the business and joining what I believe to be one of the best teams uh, in the industry was a no brainer. Uh, and so like, like Jason mentioned, my responsibilities are corporate development. So building the company's presence in the capital markets uh, and I handle all uh, investor relations. Thanks for that, Jason. And lastly, Raphael Dutois just joined the team. Uh, he's a PhD geologist in geostatistics and resource optimization. Uh, he was the head resource guy at uh, I Am Gold. He was actually my boss's boss for a number of years while I was there. Uh, so we're lucky that uh, he has now joined the team as well. Oh, there we go. 
uh, uh, from a share structure point of view, I think, you know, you commonly do not see a roster like this on companies sub $100 million market cap. And I just think that speaks to the, the credibility of our team from the likes of Merck, Eric Sprott, Vescor, Franklin Templeton, which is one of the largest precious metals funds in the United States, uh, Century in Ausbill, you commonly don't see them. And I think that speaks miles to the, to the track record of the team. Uh, so we're 50% institutionally held, pretty tight float with 26 and a half uh, retail. Management is, is just over 11%. Uh, I myself, I'm the, I guess, just the third largest shareholder under Eric Sprott. You know, I, I was a geologist for a number of years of my life. It's not like I was running a hedge fund or anything. I put over $550,000 of my own money into this company. Uh, so it's a significant chunk of, of my savings. Um, right now, like I said, we already mentioned the ca cash balance is under 16. Uh, 138 million out uh, on a basic basis. Uh, we're increasing our, our analyst coverage. Uh, we just got coverage from Sprott uh, yesterday. We should have Cormark joining in the next month or two. Uh, what these guys are really modeling and led by kind of Jason and, and, and our team here is, is really a project that is gonna cost around 100 and $130 million to build. Uh, it's going to spit out over 110,000 ounces per annum. Uh, and you're really looking at an operating cost of around $8, so $2 a ton mining, four processing, two GNA. The really robust high margin uh, economics on these projects. So they're spitting out around a $400 million NAV uh, and then giving a 60% multiple to NAV to, to get you your target price. Uh, if anyone has questions about this, we can we can discuss later on. I think it's important uh, as we build our brand as millennial uh, and frankly, as we rebrand our industry uh, that we go above and beyond from a, from a social and a governance perspective. Um, one of my passion projects on the side is, is really educating um, the next generation of investor and the next generation of mining entrepreneur that, you know, frankly, uh, my generation as a millennial uh, thinks the eggs come from the fridge, so to speak. And they don't understand that mining is a key pillar to our society and it can be done in an economically and socially responsible manner. So we will do annual ESG reporting as well. I'm gonna get into the assets right now. Um, I'll start off with Wildcat. Wildcat, we will start drilling in the springtime of 2022. Right now, it's important to note these are pit constrained ounces. So there's actual economic parameters that go into constraining this resource. So we are using a $1,500 pit shell, $2 a ton mining, $4 a ton processing, and $2 a ton GNA. Also, we are using an 80% recovery. To put that in perspective for everyone, uh, Rochester, which is a comparable in Nevada, operates around $4.98, and we're using $8. So um, you know, still quite uh, quite conservative. The oxides leach around 80 to 85%. We use 80. Uh, we know the sulfides, which is not included in the resource, leach around 30 to, to 55%. Uh, right now, the resource sits at 776,000 ounces, no strip. And that's what I'll get into uh, later on in the presentation is that mining is, I, I don't like saying mining is easy because it is not. But when you're looking at projects, it, it just comes down to margin, okay? And, and I'll get into how not it's not just about the grade, it's also about the strip and it's also about the recovery that drive the economics to these projects. Um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the program will kick off uh, in April, May, depending on when the snow buggers off. The, the objective of the program is to identify the plumbing system uh, to expand the resource, to see what the resource conversion is. It's 44 holes, just over 4,000 meters. That'll feed the updated resource in the third quarter, and that resource will feed the PEA in the fourth quarter. Um, I'm not gonna get, again, too technical into this, but the way these things form is, think about them as a mushroom, is the fluids migrate up vertically, hits a more permeable unit, and then bleeds out. So fluid pathway is like that. 
And this zone produces this nice low grade disseminated zone. And then the Bonanza zone sits right underneath there. And there's historical samples from the early 1900s of you know a couple of meters of over a thousand grams. So part of that program is identifying that Bonanza zone while converting the resources uh, within the pit to feed the PEA. Uh, it should be noted that right now, it's that red line in above is what sits in the resource. All of these blocks below that pit are not in the current resource, okay? It's also important to note that there are major gaps that sit outside the pit. And why they sit there is because of lack of drilling. Uh, when you're running your resource optimization, uh, you need certain amount of pierce points to bring the blocks together. So what we have learned through detailed mapping and being very pragmatic and systematic about it is that the mineralizing horizon is 2.3 kilometers by 1.2 kilometers, and the oxidation profile is about 150 meters. So, you know, doing the back of the envelope math using 2.7 for density and being conservative uh, that, you know, about 60% of that is ore, the strip might come up a bit. Uh, you're looking at over 200 million tons, and we're currently sitting at 62. So the growth potential behind these resources is significant. I'm not saying we're gonna, you know, 3X the resource and, and the updated resource. It's gonna be about a year to two years to, to really drill the whole thing off, okay? I'm gonna hey, get Jay, into let me just jump in quick. I think it's important for you and just maybe to touch on the history of the assets and, you know, why, the, what creates the opportunity for us is essentially you know, who the past owner was and what the situation they were in, right? Totally, thanks for, thanks for that. So just so everyone knows is these assets came uh, out of Allied Nevada via water team. So Allied Nevada went bankrupt and went bust. Uh, and what was happening when they were drilling these assets off is the mine that they had in, that it was in production uh, was in dire straits, okay? And these got little to no attention. They went bust. They went into a $2 billion private equity firm. The private equity firm never even went to site, never looked at the rocks. And that was the reason why we were able to get it out of that private equity firm. Uh, they are not explorationists. They don't develop mines. They buy assets out of bankruptcy. Uh, this was in a, in a bigger portfolio that they purchased from Allied Nevada. Um, as I mentioned, they were going bust because of, of, of a mine they had production high crop. So these have seen little to no attention for over, over a decade. Uh, and we strongly believe that they left the job half done um, and never drilled them off completely. Okay. I'm going to talk about Mountain View. Again, came from Allied Nevada, part of the growth portfolio. Like I mentioned, think about uh, Mountain View and Wildcat is one project. They will be a joint PEA as from to lower the CapEx, what you will do is you would truck the loaded carbon from Mountain View to Wildcat and then have a centralized stripping facility to lower your CapEx. Um, right now, these are pick and strain ounces at $1,500 gold, $2 ton mining, four processing, two G&A. The oxides, these are oxides only. Oxides leach around 80 to 85%. We use 80. The grade is significantly higher, 0.57, sitting at 427,000 ounces and a slightly higher strip at 2.7. I should just mention to everyone out there, just so everyone knows, the average grade of the Great Basin for oxides is 0.32, okay? Um, the program right now is ongoing. Uh, we just put out a spectacular hole today of 232 meters of 0.9. So, you know, three times the average grade of the Great Basin in Nevada. But what the program was designed to do is, again, identify the plumbing system, see where the, what the resource conversion rate was so we could feed the updated resource that will feed the PEA, see where it's closed off because it's not open in every direction, uh, and see where it is open. The whole, the program was designed uh, 30 holes, 7,200 meters. Uh, we just put out our 16th hole. We have 2,700 meters left. 
what we realize is the grade continues to increase at depth and into the basin. The grade is higher, significantly higher than expected in the block model. And why that is, is the, the block model was run uh, using RC, so reverse circulation holes. Uh, and what happens when you're drilling it in the basin and you have a lot of water um, discharging from the face of the bit, you flush out all of your fines and your free gold. So not only do we use core to, to correct against that, but also to put a, a more robust geological model together. Um, what we've also known is, remember, are we talking about the feeder zones? And that's the stem of the mushroom that hits a and then it hit the, the fluid migrates up the stem and then hits a lower grade disseminated cap. And we're seeing really strong evidence of this feeder zone. You know, I'm talking three meters of 50 grams with almost a meter of 141 grams. Um, you know, today's hole was 232 meters at 0.9, including, you know, intercepts of 11 meters of 10 grams. Um, the consistency of mineralization is, is what's really spectacular here. You know, 275 meters of 0 0.5, 164 of, of 0 0.3. Um, the other thing I should mention too is the oxidation profile is significantly deeper than expected. You can see this image right here from today's hole. You know, that's a meter of, of 24 grams and it's still oxidized at 320 meters. The other thing to note is that the strip, which is causing the higher strip, that 2.7, is this yellow material. And that yellow material is composed of sand and gravel. So from a stripping perspective, it won't be conventional drill and blast. Uh, it'll be digging it out with a hoe and a, and a dozer. So your mining costs for your pre-strip aren't gonna be $2. They'll probably be a dollar, dollar fifty, something like that. The other thing to note is that the resource actually does daylight to the eastern margin of the pit. Okay, uh, I won't get into this in, in, in too great a detail, uh, but what I want the audience to understand is that we're only looking at this little pit right here. Not only do we have the feeders that have never been drilled off that we believe strongly that we are on the path to discovery of the main feeder zone. But what controls this is this range front fault. Um, and the fluid uses that fault to migrate up. And wherever you have dilational jogs, so inflection points in the fault, is you have areas that remove confining pressure of higher fluid flow, so it allows for flash, flash boiling, to cause the gold to precipitate out of the aqueous fluid. Uh, sorry if I got a little too technical there, but what I'm trying to get at is that there are the, the plausibility of having two other mineralized centers along that three and a half kilometer trend is highly probable. And you commonly see this in the Sierra Massif from the Sierra Madre. Uh, the last asset I'll talk about just briefly is Red Canyon. And as an exploration guy, it does get me really excited. We did 12 holes, 2,300 meters um, in one of 10 targets. I should note that this asset has never been in the public markets. Uh, it was owned by a private landsman, Ed Devinis, uh, and he's been building on this land package uh, since 1986, I believe. What we put out were some of the, you know, the best drill holes I've seen to date uh, in Nevada. You know, I'm talking anywhere from 50 meters to 11 meters, you know, 50 meters of four and a half gram oxide from surface. And as I mentioned, the average grade of the Great Basin is 0.32. So orders of magnitude high, okay? And it's right at surface. Um, there are a lot of big companies looking at this asset. Uh, because it checks all of the boxes for world-class Carlin style systems. And what you want to look for in these Carlin systems is where, where are you in the stratigraphy? And we happen to sit in the Wenband formation, which is the most productive horizon, or most productive rocks 
in Nevada. So it hosts Cortez, Pipeline, Horse Canyon, Gold Rush, which I believe combined are over 100 million ounces. The other big thing is, is that it needs deep seated faults. So you need those faults for fluid flow. And the wall fault that rips through our property is the same fault that rips through the Cortez complex. And lastly, the most important thing, and for your audience out there to, today, when you're listening to anyone say there's a, they have a Carlin style system, uh, one of the key criteria is, is do they have intrusive rocks on the property? And what is the age of the intrusive rocks? Because the peak mineralizing event in Nevada is between 40 million and 30 million years old. And we sit at 35.5. So right at the peak of mineralization for these types of systems is a critical element. So Red Canyon checks all these boxes to be a world-class system. And reality is, is that the ounces at Mountain View and Wildcat put a peg in the end valuation. And assets like Red Canyon, Dune, Eden, Mar, Oslo, Sierra, Colorado are really your blue sky and your free carry that give you a little bit of added torque uh, in, the, in the development company. Hey, uh, just to ask real quick, Jason, you said that other companies, um, you know, looking in the Red Canyon, you're looking at Red Canyon, that area. Are you talking about potentially, um, you know, selling it or working on like a joint venture for that property? What? Yeah, is- what we're. We're, we're looking at uh, a few things, uh, and that's kind of all I could say right now. Um, you know, the reality is, is there's probably around 300 to 500,000 ounces there right now. We share the same road uh, with McEwen Mining to Gold Bar in Tonkin Springs. Tonkin Springs, excuse me. Um, so there's a lot of levers we can pull with that asset. Um, and it really has something that could be world-class, but at the same time, uh, I'll be very open and transparent is that those systems cost quite a bit of money to drill off. So we need to be cognizant on how we allocate our capital uh, um, because I hate companies that say, you know, drilling is a sunk cost. The reality is drilling is not a sunk cost and the shareholders need to get their money out. So, you know, when you're able to, put up, you know, a couple of million ounces at Mountain View and Wildcat for say five to 8 million bucks, but to put up a million uh, ounces at Red Canyon or orogenic systems uh, like Caribou, which was Cisco Development owns, you know, those projects can take north of 35, $40 million to drill off a million ounces. So your cost per discoverable ounce uh, has to you had to take that in a fact when you're designing your exploration program to minimize against dilution and look for assets that you could drill off cheaply. Um, so your cost per discoverable ounce is extremely low. So there are levers to pull uh, and we are looking at a few things. Got it, thank um, you. No worries. Uh, I think this is one of the most important slides uh, we have in our presentation. And why it's important is to show everyone out there that grade is not king. What is king is margin, okay? Just like any other business in the world, okay? Uh, And while you have to look at these projects is you need to do the grade divided by the strip to get the effective grade of the deposit. So the real grade of the deposit. And when you do that, Millennial has the highest open pit oxide project in the best mining jurisdiction in the world. And that speaks to the quality of these ounces. You know, a lot of people think Gold Bar, which McEwen has, or GSV, the railroad project are high grade. The reality is, is when you factor in the strip, you know, GSV actually sits at 0.28. McEwen uh, actually sits at 0.14. So, to put it simple math, you know, at 0. 0.42, 0. 0.45, you're looking at $35 a ton in situ rock. And our operating costs are $8. That is a high margin business. And that's what we're building. Um, quickly, uh, from, a, from a benchmarking perspective, 
again, I want to touch on this because it's very important to, to everyone to understand that all ounces cannot be treated equally. And unfortunately, people do a total resource or EV divided by your total resource to get an EV ounce rating to, to rank you against your peer group. But you got to remember that, you know, things like Integra or, or GSV or Nighthawk or O3, those, a lot of those are sulfide ounces or refractory ounces. So for example, GSV actually only sits at 1.2 million ounces of oxide. And the rest of that, uh, the 1.7 is refractory. And in order to pr pr process refractory ore, uh, you know, it's a 10 year lineup to use one of the autoclaves and your cost goes way up. You know, for sulfides, you need to build a mill or toll mill it. So your cost goes way up. So, you know, when you look at GSV using only their oxides or Integra only their oxides, they're trading closer to 80 to $100 an ounce, okay? So in our next resource update, you know, I have clear visibility to one and a half to 2 million ounces of oxide only. Once we do more met work and understand the leach kinetics on the transition zone, I will comment on that, but I wanna be conservative. Uh, when I quote that, but as you saw in the slide at Wildcat and, and at Mountain View, there is significant resource growth potential over the coming years. Uh, from a news flow perspective, you know, it's a he heavy stream of positive news flow. Uh, it's originally led by the, by the drill bit. So you'll see consistent results coming from Mountain View as we have three rigs turning right there now. Uh, then they'll move to Wildcat. You'll see the, the metallurgy come back. You'll see the updated resource in the third quarter. Uh, then the second program at Red Canyon, it's 1,500 meters. Uh, and then it'll be all tied up in a little bow with the PEA that will combine Wildcat and Mountain View as a joint PEA. Um, and just in summary, you know, you have a very well diversified portfolio of assets. You've had a team who's done this multiple times and put up, you know, 51, 59 million ounces of discovery. You're in the best, literally the best mining jurisdiction in the world, ranked by the Fraser Institute. You have a strong resource base that will continue to grow. And these are the highest quality ounces globally. Uh, you have an institutional shareholder base um, from the likes of Franklin, Eric Sprott, you have myself and Jason Banducci consistently buying in the market. Um, and you probably don't see uh, institutions like that in companies like this. And that speaks to the track record of our team. Uh, and then, you know, a catalyst for its story, as I just discussed. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll open up the room for questions. I think I was just over 30 minutes there. So apologize, that's, Anthony. If no, I went that, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, you know, obviously, uh, companies on track to become a, a multi-million ounce producer. Those are very, very impressive uh, drill results, to say the least, um, so far at, at Mountain View and, and Wildcat. So um, I'm going to open the, we have some questions in queue, but I'm going to open it up um, for additional questions. Um, we're going to wait a moment. I'm sure more questions will come in. Uh, for those attending today, the code word is swordfish. Okay, so we're going to go through the beginning. Um, I'm just going to read these. I think this is a really good question, and you touched on it at the beginning. What's the cost savings using heap leaching compared to conventional me methods? Okay, so so for for processing, uh, to put it into perspective, um, for processing alone, you're looking in, in a heap leach project. You're looking at four dollars a ton processing uh, in a project with 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 sulfides. Uh, you're in the ballpark to $40 to $60. So a huge, huge difference. Yeah, that's a major difference. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about Eric Sprott's um, position? Is it free trading? Can you discuss what his cost is? Yeah, so um, Eric's paper most of it is 80% of it, 75% is free trading right now. 
Um, all these institutions and Eric, um, their average uh, in price is around 47 cents. Right. Okay. And your, um, there was a question of uh, where you were headquartered. Um, obviously, you're headquartered in, in Canada, but your, your properties are in Nevada and US based, correct? Correct. So uh, our head office is in Toronto as we as we trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We also trade on the OTC QB, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of our assets are in Nevada, and you know I spend half my time uh, in Nevada in in, in, in and out of, uh, out of out of Reno. Yep. Um, so this is another good question. Um, so can you talk about news flow for twenty twenty two? I know you're going to get pretty aggressive on drill results. Um, so can you give a timeline? Is this something we're going to see on a, on a monthly basis? Uh, you know, how often are, are you going to be making announcements in terms of, uh, of drill results? Yeah, so we, we want to keep a consistent news flow to the market. Any lull in news flow isn't good. We know that. I'm very cognizant of that. And that's why I designed the program not only to be systematic and pragmatic on how you approach it from an exploration perspective, which we have to do. But at the other side, there is a marketing perspective. So the way we've built out this drill drill program is to have consistent news flow every month. So every four to six weeks, you will see drill results coming out. Um, We'll probably batch them out. Um, um, But, you know, from basically the drill to the market, you're looking at about a four to six week turnaround time. So like I said, every four to six weeks. Great, yeah. And that's, I think, really important um, for sure. Uh, what's the expectation of the capital expenditures needed over the next 18 to 36 months? Uh, how do you expect to cover operating costs? Yeah, so we're fully financed to do everything. So, you know, the big thing is, is the drill program, which is 8 million bucks, the PEA is 360,000, I believe, 363,000. Um, the plan of operations permit, which will allow us to drill you know, anything we want, is, is $3 million. Um, so, you know, by the end of the year, uh, I, I just call a spade a spade is that we will need to raise money by the end of the year. Uh, yeah. in, in order to advance projects, uh, we have to do that. Um, that's our source of, of kind of capital to, to do this. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, as the third largest shareholder, you know, I don't want to get diluted into oblivion. And I'm very cognizant of when and how we raise capital. Um, you know, our last financing was done at 50 cents. Uh, it was $24 million. It was way oversubscribed. oversubscribed. We went up on $15 million uh, and we had $32 million of demand. Uh, I do not put warrants on my financings, I, on our financing, sorry. Uh, and Jason Banducci believes strongly in that as well. Uh, they, you know, they kind of put a cap on your stock and it's a sniff of, of being a little bit desperate. And I think we're in, we're in a pretty good seat here where we, we don't need cash anytime soon. Uh, and we have great uh, assets and a great team that are really uh, adding value um, every quarter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so another question is the plan to de-risk and sell the assets to a larger company or take the assets into production? You know, uh, I would. I know that's a tough question to answer. I I get it. I get it all the time. And the the reality is, is that I myself have rebuilt this company to build a real mining company, and that's why we have such a diversified portfolio of assets. Um, And I would love to build a mining company. That is, that's that's been my dream since I was a little kid. And I hate companies that say, we're going to drill this off and we're going to do a PEA and then we're going to sell it. That's not how you build a real business. Um, And you, that is not in your control. So our strategy as a, as a, as a company and as a team is to develop these assets and get them in a permitting and construction um, uh, timeframe as fast as we possibly can. 
that being said, Anthony, you know, you know, when you look at this chart right here, you know, Hasbrook is 70% owned by Sun Valley. That's gone. Pan is gone. GSV is 200, $250 million company. That's gone. That's gone. Uh, and, you know, these guys are kind of bigger, bigger companies. Um, so there's a significant scarcity for these types of projects. Um, and, you know, if someone, uh, I don't have an ego to, to build a mining company like some CEOs I know. I'm in the business of, of making money for my shareholders and me as the third largest one myself, to be quite frank. Yeah. Um, so if someone came knocking on the door and said, hey, here's $150 an ounce, fine. But it has, what I'm getting at is it has to be the, on the right terms, okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is a question um, about COVID. So have you seen any issues with COVID in terms of drilling, permitting, anything like that? Yeah, you know, it, COVID obviously has affected us. Um, all of our employees and drillers are, are vaccinated, but as everyone knows, that's not really helping right now. Um, so has it slowed things down? Yes, because guys have to go into quarantine and then there's not enough drillers out there. So has it slowed things down? Yes, it's, it's slowed the entire world down. We do our best job to minimize it. Um, with respects to permitting, it has slowed that down as well. Um, because the, the BLM office that, that does all the permit review isn't open for in-person meetings. That being said, operating in Nevada is, is much better than other states. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, you know, long story long, it, it has impacted us, but uh, we kind of minimize, minimize the impact uh, by having everyone vaccinated and proper quarantine procedures and uh, having our own internal permitting team that has, you know, pretty good connections with the local BLM, BLM yeah. offices. So it doesn't affect us too much. Have you seen any issues like in terms of, um, in terms of it getting more expensive to drill, like within, you know, inflationary pressures in that regard? A hundred percent. So yeah. the cost, you cannot find drill rods. Yeah. The cost for drill rods is double. Wow. Okay. So that's just the, just the price of steel, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, drilling costs have, have gone up and that's the reality when you know, you're seeing inflation numbers about, what was it, 7% the other day? Yep. Um, you know, that's, that's the world we live in. But, you know, luckily, um, you know, I think we're in a perfect environment for, for gold to be, a, be kind of a, a real safe haven here. And as you mentioned earlier in your presentation, you know, companies with, you know, de-risked ounces that are going to consistently grow, that have cash, that have the team, and that are in the best mining jurisdiction in the world, those are the ones that when gold really shines, those are the ones that are going to go first. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, too, um, there could be um, consolidation as well. Yeah, I know that you're talking yeah. about you know, um, holding out, which obviously I think with some of the drill results you have and the properties you have, um, obviously makes sense. But, um, you know, uh, I talk to a lot of mining executives and it's getting harder and harder to find good properties. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, there, there's a, there's a huge scarcity of, of, of these projects. And, uh, yeah, I think you are going to see a lot of consolidation, um, you know, and especially for ones like I, like I said, this slide says it all. Yep. This is the highest effective open pit oxide project in the best mine jurisdiction. And, you know, the top ones have already been taken out and GSV is a $200 million company, 250 million was at one point a billion dollars. Uh, and, you know, we're sitting at 70. So there's yeah. a lot of re-rating potential in the next kind of, 12 to 24 months. Yeah. Um, a question getting back to what we were, we, we talked about a little bit earlier, a bit confused about the corporate structure is headquartered in Canada. The presentation says MPM is a Nevada corporation. Can you just clarify? 
So uh, the way that the company is set up is it is the, the main, the parent company is Millennial Precious Metals. It then has, and it's headquartered in Toronto. And then it has um, Millennial Nevada LLC, which is a subsidiary of Millennial Precious Metals. And that Millennial uh, Nevada LLC is obviously a US sub. And then the way we've designed the company is that the exploration assets sit in Millennial Exploration LLC. So that's the exploration assets. And then Wildcat and Mountain View sit in Millennial Nevada Development LLC. So that if someone were to show us an offer that those assets can be taken out and not trigger a tax event for the exploration assets. Gotcha. Um, Anthony, I'm just gonna jump yep. in quick. And I think that the question partially pertains to why we are based in Toronto and, and why we have assets in the US. And I think part of the reason like Jason alluded to is we are primarily listed on the TSX. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look globally at where 90% of the world's junior mining companies are listed, it's the TSX and the ASX. And for us, obviously it makes a lot more sense given where our, our management team is and given where our assets are to list on the TSX. Um, you know, for a long time, the TSX has been the world's, you know, ecosystem for junior mining companies. So it's where junior, you know, it's where junior mining companies list. It's where junior mining companies can raise capital. Again, for a long time, the TSX has been the top uh, exchange for, for raising mining equity. Uh, and it's also where you've had a long history of brokers and uh, whether it's investment banking services, lawyers, people that understand the junior mining business. Um, you know, case in point, if you look at the brokers that cover our stock, E Capital, Sprott, uh, Stiefel and, and, and GMP, you know, these are brokers that have a long history uh, that understand junior mining capital markets. And if you look at the U.S., a lot of the bigger brokers in the U.S. don't have the same capabilities. Like, sure, you know, Goldman Sachs and, and, and those guys cover the barracks of the world. But mm -hmm. for companies like Millennial, it is truly the most advantageous place for us to be uh, headquartered is, is Toronto. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that, Jason. So obviously, investors always want to know about the infrastructure around the resources. So with these properties being in Nevada, um, is it safe to assume the area has everything you need uh, in terms of roads, power, water, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I, I apologize. And, and you know, I think, I think when, you, when you're saying Nevada, that, that type of stuff is a given. Uh, yeah. Literally, all of these can be accessed off a major highway. The power line literally runs right over the, it, literally the power line runs like this the valley mm -hmm. uh there's a major highway there there's a major highway there they're connected by a gravel road that will you be used for hauling uh there's a bunch of water that sits in the basin uh so all the key infrastructure that you really need is is, is there and, and and that's why nevada is such an amazing place to operate uh and you know there's no trees and endangered species and you know the things that you really got to worry about when you're uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Canadian myself. I've, I've done a lot of work throughout uh, Africa, which I don't really, really want to go back to. Uh, and then spent a lot of time in, in kind of Northern Ontario, Quebec and BC. And, you know, those are pristine, you know, lakes and rivers with protected fish and, and all of that sort of stuff. We're up on mountains and beautiful glaciers that feed the reservoir into the ocean. And, you know, or in Nevada, you're in the basin, there's no trees, it's arid environment, there's no one around. So, and all the infrastructure is there, which is great. And that's why it's the number one place to work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And, and I, I figured that was the case, but sometimes, you know, we talk to other mining companies who are um, in, in different parts of the world, even in Mexico, um, you know, they have to build out, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the infrastructure around them. Uh, so what's the overall gold silver percentage like with all the properties? I mean, you're primarily a gold and you're primarily a gold producer, but is there some silver? Is there a ratio in there that you can give us? Yeah, you're, you're about four to one gold okay. and silver. Uh, 
you know, that said, um, the, the silver does give a nice little credit at the end of the day. Um, you know, especially at, at, at Wildcat where you're, you know, anywhere from almost 7 million ounces of, of silver. Um, the property that we just picked up in Arizona, um, and we're just building out the slide and our graphic designer is kind of dealing with that right now, uh, is a beautiful high grade silver system. So there's three kind of hilltops and there's these silver veins, stock working veins that sit on the hilltops. And there's, you know, up to, uh, I think the highest sample we took uh, was 17,000 grams silver. Wow. So, so that, that will come into play and, and we'll start doing work on that uh, uh, this year, especially in the winter time when it's, it's nice and cool in Arizona. The other exciting thing about the Sierra Colorado property that we just, it's, a, it's an earn in agreement, back end heavy. The other exciting thing is that um, in the basin or so around these, these hilltops, there's a lot of copper porphyry potential. So HUD Bay surrounds us, BHP surrounds us. Um, uh, so, you know, you're, we're right in the right rocks and the right system. So that Sierra Colorado asset has a, as a lot more uh, silver torque than, than than the rest of these do. Gotcha. So um, I want to go back one, uh, you know, um, one of our viewers has um, an additional question about uh, the corporate structure. Just following up to Mr. Banducci's comments, my understanding is there is no listing requirement of the TSX, TSX that an issuer have an office in Canada, and there is no requirement that an issue be incorporated in Canada. Um, so I guess if you could just clarify that a little more in terms of um, the reason for the separation. Uh, ben, do you want to weigh in here? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, I think it's a function of a couple of things. One of which is the team was Toronto based or, and the fact is, is this is where the, the IP of the business sits. Uh, and again, I think if you look at most of, our peers, a lot of the gold exploration companies, there's a lot of companies with a head office in Toronto and assets uh, elsewhere. I think, you know, globally across junior mining, uh, intermediate and senior, 50% of the world's uh, uh, mining companies are listed on the TSX. And again, it's, you don't necessarily need to have a headquarters here, but the reality is, and again, maybe the world is changing with COVID, but to have a team here so you can interact with all of our partners that help us run a company, uh, there's a lot of our, our our stakeholders are in Canada, are in Toronto. Uh, yep. And yes, our, our, our key assets are in the U.S. And we think this is this is a, you know, an excellent way to, to run the business. Yeah, and I, we have uh, had other clients, you know, based in Vancouver who own plenty of properties in the States. So um it's pretty normal stru structure i think yeah it's, it's it's very typical i think if you look across most of our peers you'd find a very similar structure yeah um can you talk about the ownership uh structure of the properties Do you have to pay royalties on any of them like how does it how does it work yeah okay so um wildcat and mountain view uh and when we acquired them from ally nevada uh, we granted them a half a percent NSR. So Wildcat and Mountain View have a two and a two and a half percent NSR to a bunch of different groups. Dune, Eden, Mar, Oslo had no royalties on them, which is extremely rare in Nevada. So we granted Waterton a 2% NSR on each of them and then a right to buy back each of those NSRs. So, so to buy back 1% for one and a half million dollars on each of them. Mm. Red Canyon, amazingly enough, you know, right in the heart of the Battle of Eureka Trend had no royalties. So again, we granted them a 2% NSR, but we have the right to buy back 1% um, for one and a half million. There is also a state uh, NSR of 0.75%. Banducci, I know it's a sliding scale. What is it? Uh, it goes from 0.75 to point to one and a half? One point one, I think, and it's 1. dependent 1. on the revenue generated from the mine. Gotcha. That's actually very favorable. That's, that's yeah. great. 
Yeah, so um, a lot higher elsewhere in the world than point. You know, I believe it's it's a sliding scale. As soon as you're above a hundred million dollars in cash flow, I, I think is the threshold is when it starts going up. Anything below a hundred million uh, is 075 percent, which is you know, there's places in Africa that's like twenty percent. Yeah, so, no, I, I yeah, I've seen I've seen nightmare scenarios for sure. Um, Want to? You have one more question I wanted to present. So obviously, you have a lot on your plate um, with with the key um, properties you're drilling right now. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline for like Eden Dune Mar Oslo and uh, in the Cerro Colorado project? Um, you know, obviously, you you have priorities right now, but can you give like a loose time frame on? on yeah. So so. A lot of the work, uh, so Oslo, Mar, and Sierra Colorado are getting worked on this year. The budget's $525,000. Um, so the idea is, is that these require phase one target generation work. So soil sampling, mapping, grab samples, some more geophysics. So you know, very, being very systematic about how we do this and, and pragmatic. And then once we get all of that data, Mar, Oslo, or Sierra Colorado, we will rank them internally. And then in 2023, one of those three will be brought to a drill stage. Gotcha. So that's the way we, that's the way we build it is that um, we do the, 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 the scientific work in the background because it, it, it's very, difficult to to explain that to the market and then when mountain view and wildcat go into a mine permit stage in in, in hopefully 2023 um and red canyon goes to a resource stage one of mar oslo or sierra colorado goes to a drill stage so you always have that growth internally yeah um and you know mar and oslo uh eden and dune are very exciting. Like these are really amazing targets that a junior company would be lucky to have. Yeah. And, and where we saw a lot of potential uh, when we were doing the 337 desktop reviews and 47 site visits, a lot of junior companies or a lot of majors or other companies have a lot of the same exploration model. And they just look uh, you know, on these main trends, okay? So the Walker Lane trend, the Battle Mount Eureka, the Carlin, the Independence, the Getchell, uh, the Northwest Rift. So they look at all these main trends. And a lot of the discoveries that have been made there are, they've been made. And some of the people have this idea that Oh, because there's a nice alteration signature in the upper plate, we're going to drill through the upper plate and the lower plate is going to be mineralized. That's exactly how you go broke as a junior company. Yeah. That's yeah. let let Barrick and Anglo and Kinross do that stuff. Where we saw a lot of the potential uh, in Nevada is in these basins. So, you know, in these basins that sit off the main trends that have never really been looked at. And these assets sit in the basin in the epithermal environment uh, and they have amazing mercury, arsenic, antimony signatures that really haven't been drilled that much or drilled really shallow. And I think that's where you're gonna see a lot of discoveries come out of Nevada is not on the main trends anymore, but into the basin. Uh, and it's a different age of mineralization. So on the main trends, the mineralization is between 40 million and 30 million. And in the basin, it's, it's happening as you're rifting, you're creating the basin as you're rifting. So the age of mineralization in the basin is, is, is around 18 to 14 million. Yeah, exciting to see what will happen with those properties yeah. when, when you get there. Um, we are at... Um, an hour right now. So I think we're going to leave it there. Guys, I really appreciate you coming on today to get us up to speed on the company. Obviously, a lot of exciting things happening, uh, not only with the company, but in the metal space. And I expect um, that you will uh, continue to deliver positive drill results throughout 2022. 
Um, before we wrap it up, Jason, either Jason, uh, do you have any parting words just for our group, just based on, you know, valuation or, or, you know, why this is such a, a you know, um, you know, a compelling, uh, you know, investment at this point? Yeah. You know, first off, thanks for everyone for, for taking the time to listen. And, you know, like, it, I, like I touched on is that these are the highest grade open pit oxide project of the effective grade, really. It, it, it's the highest and the best mining jurisdiction in the world. Uh, you know, we got a strong cash balance. Um, and, you know, frankly, Anthony, is that I let the drill bit and the assets do the marketing. And, and you're going to see some really exciting things come out of Mountain View. And yeah. probably even more exciting things come from Wildcat, which makes my job and Jason's job a lot easier. Because, you know, when you put out 230 meters of 0.9 oxide, you know, I don't really have to say much. <laughs> to be quite nope. frank. Absolutely. So, and, I, and I think the roster of institutional clients, you know, for a company with a market cap of under 100 million, I've never seen it before. Yeah. So, you know, and that speaks to, you know, our team. You know, we've done this so many times that, uh, you know, all, there's always some differences. That, that, that's for sure. Um, um, and that's what makes it fun. Uh, but we've done it so many times, and, and that's why you see guys like Franklin and, and Sentry and, and Merck and Eric involved is because they trust us because we've done it a, a number of times. Absolutely. So, okay, I guess we're going to leave it there. Uh, in the meantime, if you want additional information on Millennial Precious Metals, you can go to their comprehensive website, millennialpreciousmetals.com, uh, including the company's uh, details on the company's current projects, as well as the latest press releases. I know that they're going to uh, give us a lot of great news this year. So, um, you know, I'll keep you posted on that. And I want to thank all of our attendees for taking the time today to get up to speed on the company. I look forward to your feedback. I'm going to send out a feedback link right um, after we conclude. Uh, your feedback is not only very important to uh, our clients, but it's very important to Tory Hills as well. So I uh, look forward to getting everybody's feedback. So um, with that said, uh, until the next time, guys, uh, be safe, be well, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Thanks, everyone. Thanks.